Chapter 11 The Last of the Black Empires On a balmy spring afternoon in 1964, I came out of a large cave where archaeologists had been working and climbed up the highest of the six hills in the area. In the valley, and as far as the eyes could see, there was so much of the same breathtaking natural beauty that had been seen everywhere in the country that one might wonder whether the Garden of Eden surpassed it. I was standing in the heart of Mano Motapa, now white-ruled Rhodesia, the last of the black empires in Africa. Abyssinia, or modern Ethiopia, has been under Semitic or Solomonoid rule for centuries. The ruling house traces its line to King Solomon. Up to this point, we have been dealing very largely with states created or expanded by migrating groups before the coming of Asians and Europeans into their territories. We have therefore been looking at purely African created institutions, but the picture has been very much skewed by the fact that very little attention was given to the advanced state of early civilization in other parts of the continent prior to the incursions of this or that group of immigrants after the 1200s AD. This kind of treatment has misled many in the belief that a highly advanced civilization existed only in the Nile regions of ancient Ethiopia, Egypt and the Sudan, and would spread southward therefrom by the various waves of immigrants. The simple truth is that there were northward migrations as well as southward from the earliest times. That these early black brothers from the south probably brought more to their black brothers in Egypt than they borrowed from them is becoming clearer as our research develops. The stepped up waves of crisis migrations after the destruction of the Ethiopian Empire should not obscure the central facts. The invading immigrants then often found the already existing states as well organized and with institutions as highly advanced as their own had been before the 13th century. But almost without exception, they all had one thing in common, the one thing that made each one so easy to conquer first by black invaders and later by white invaders. They were all small. The smaller and weaker the state, the more fiercely independent it was. The African continent presented a vast, vast panorama of many states, at once a vast panorama of disunity and weakness. The reorganizing invaders tended to expand territorially over many of these adjacent states, thus forcing a kind of artificial unity. Unlike the Cuba of Cheyenne and the Angola of Nzinga, few undertook the great task of developing a sense of national community among the many diverse groups that made up the state. The Vakaranga immigrants who developed the empire of Mano Motapa followed the general practice of establishing effective political rule while promoting economic development. As forecast above, however, we shall look briefly at the people and their civilization some centuries before the Vakaranga advent in the early 1400s. The land and the people to be covered by the empire extended from the north above the Zambezi River, included Rhodesia, westward to the Kalahara, eastward over Mozambique to the Indian Ocean, and southward into the Transvaal in South Africa below the Limpopo River, Vembe. Since the archaeological evidence gathered all over this vast territory makes it clear that iron technology and allied crafts were well advanced here long before the Christian era, 
The spread of the economic revolution over Africa by the Iron Age may have come from this southern center as well as from Moro in the northeast. From the period roughly indicated as early as 300 BC, the states which were to form the empire of Mano Motapa were engaged in a wide range of diversified economic activities that led not only to interstate trade but foreign commerce over the Indian Ocean as well. This economic development was inextricably an index of the development of their civilization. The drive for the attainment of excellence in everything produced was reflected in their artistic endeavors even on common utilities where art could hardly be expected. The huge jars for storing grain were glazed and as beautifully channeled as the cups used by priests and kings. Here, as elsewhere in early Africa, there seems to have been an insatiable drive for beauty and perfection. There was an underlying philosophy. Each craftsman felt that his finished work was at once a reflection and actual measure of what he himself was, his character. The industrial activities, particularly mining, overshadowed agriculture and even threatened the existence of this very basic economy. Over 4,000 ancient mining sites have been discovered, and no one claims that these are all. Iron ore, gold, and to a lesser extent copper and tin were the leading industrial activities, although ivory and ivory carvings always played a considerable role in the total economy. These widespread industrial activities, along with the ever-increasing number of cattle brought in by migrating pastoral groups, drove the farmers to the hills, to a new type of terrace farming on every available hillside, and the building of mounds for the same purpose where there were no hills. As difficult as all this was, the genius of African man was further tested in overcoming the more formidable problem of water and an irrigation system for hillsides and mounds. Widespread mining meant widespread deforestation because of the demand for timber for charcoal production, another industry by itself. Soil erosion kept pace unchecked. The steady disappearance of grasslands was assured by cattle and other roaming animals that fed on grass, the goats being the most ravishing. The agricultural life of the country was sustained by intensive terrace farming in the northeast region, of which Inyanga was the center. By 1200 AD, production and international trade had already reached the high level affluence that was to attract Arabs and Europeans to this land. Gold was the leading export commodity, although there was also a great demand in India for the superior type of ironware processed in Mano Motapa. The African smelting process and type of iron ore peculiar to the region enabled them to produce the best swords, spears, and other weapons that could be found anywhere. The iron industries created an economic revolution, not only in warfare, but also in the production of farming tools, household and kitchenware, and better mining tools. The crafts of blacksmiths, goldsmiths, coppersmiths, and tinsmiths were the most important, each being a well-organized secret society. Quite early and without any Bronze Age period, they experimented with alloys to tin and copper and began the production of bronze and bronze implements on a limited scale. The widespread pottery finds of so many different types indicate the vastness of their ceramics industries. The decorative designs of all pottery, as well as on all other artifacts found, seem to tell us that all of these early craftsmen were artists also. 
that there were many other highly skilled and professional classes is evident from the total cultural record these early blacks left behind in southern Africa. The several thousand mining sites of so many different kinds iron, gold, copper, tin suggest expert prospectors just as the ruins of nearby temples and other beautifully designed stone structures tell us that there were great black architects and stone masons here just as they had been in black Egypt when the first pyramids were built there. But the ancient ruins of so many cities, towns, and villages are the stony pages of the unwritten history we seek. And just as written records of black history were destroyed, here too in Mano Motapa, the first Arabs and Europeans to find these long since deserted sites undertook wrecking and destroying operations on a scale beyond belief. These were your modern men, your civilizers of other men. Hidden and lost in the tangled vines and trees of forest, many stone temples were still defying the centuries of passing time and standing in all the dignity of their colonnaded beauty until the twentieth century when they were wrecked by the same people who had wrecked the race of the builders. The fact that almost all of these ruins were located in or near gold mining areas enabled some writers to quote unquote explain that the wanton destruction was carried on in a feverish search for gold. But anyone viewing the nature and scale of the demolition of the massive stone structures would find it difficult to see how the search for gold involved the destruction of buildings. Their efforts were in vain, however. So much could be reassembled, reconstructed. So much could not be destroyed at all. There was, therefore, a record left, written in stone. A record that tells the story of blacks who were building a highly developed civilization in southern Africa during the same ancient period that their brothers were amazing the world by their advances in northern Ethiopia, Egypt, and its southern region, Sudan. The Empire Builders We have been establishing that the high civilization of Mano Mopata for which the invading Vakaranga have been credited, antedated their coming by at least 1500 years. During this long period, before the Rasvai chiefs led their people into the region in 1400, there were many changes and improvements in the methods and styles of the various crafts. The changes are shown by determining the period of such artifacts as pottery and the architectural designs of buildings. The Vakaranga simply continued to build upon and further developed pre-existing states. Their greatest achievement was in welding several strong states and some lesser ones into one great empire. Their second greatest achievement was the reclaiming of the seacoast lands that had been leased by the states to Asians as trading posts, but over which the Asians had gradually assumed absolute sovereignty. It is the same old story of the same techniques of penetration and domination that had to be repeated over and over in these pages as we moved from country to country. Ethiopia, Makoria, Alwa, Ghana, Malai, Songhai, the Maasai states, Congo, Angola, Cuba, all were destroyed as a direct result of the first trading post footholds established in their lands. And so it was for the other states on the continent, large and small. None withstood the sirens, songs of the fabulous riches to be gained from trade. As the history of this region of Africa is generally written, one gathers 
that the advanced cultures on the sea coast and key islands were of Asian origin. The black barbarians being confined to the interior. The fact is that while readily granting concessions for trade and settlement to the Asians on lands along the Indian Ocean coastline, Africans did not withdraw but remained as active sea captains, sailors, traders, boat and shipbuilders, and in short, in all the ongoing occupations along the coast. The builders of stone cities in the interior also built were Arabs, Indians, and later Portuguese settled at Sofala, Chinde, Kelamane, and farther north at Kilwa. When the cattle breeding Vakaranga came into the country under the leadership of the Rasfai ruling clan, they found the indigenous people more highly advanced than themselves. The fact that so many of the states came into prominence between 13th and 16th centuries were further reorganized and expanded by newcomers has tended to obscure the pre-existing civilization upon which the immigrants built. There were several kinds of invaders. Some were from a homeland only recently broken up. They could make immediate contributions from their own society of whatever was new and advanced, whatever skills or technologies that had not been lost or forgotten. Other migrating groups had been on the move from one settlement to another for so many generations that they had lost some of the most essential elements in the heritage of their distant forebearers during these constant movements from place to place. Movements which were the most potent factors in disintegrating civilization itself. And still other invaders were ruthless barbarians, pure and simple. Even these, after being absorbed by an advanced population, were often given the credit for the new advances made by the state. Some of the societies in this great region were on different levels of development. Among these were the Sotho, Tswana, Mata Dayata Daya, or the so-called Bushmen, the Vatanga, the Arabs, of course, had been slowly penetrating the interior from their seacoast footholds for over 200 years before the Vakaranga arrived. By 1400, they had their trading posts scattered throughout the independent states which were to form the empire. According to D.P. Abraham, by 1500, about 10,000 Arabs were stationed at different posts in the interior. They had been penetrating inland all the way from beyond Kilwa to stations southward below Sofala. The major built-in threat was complete before the first great Vakaranga king surveyed the scene. The Great Mutota The year was 1440. The king was Mutota. In just about any other land, he would be known to history as Mutota the Great. He and his council were apparently quick to see that even the most advanced states, each standing independently and alone, were doomed unless unified into a single nation with a strong central government. This should be achieved by voluntary association if possible. The divisive influence of the Arabs operating in the capitals of the respective states had to be obvious as they appeared not to feel it necessary to be either as secretive or as subtle as their Portuguese enemies. Both the Arabs and the Europeans had one thing in common however. Both had the deeply rooted conviction that they knew the blacks and that their power over them and the continued ability to garner their endless wealth rested squarely on keeping them divided and continuously at each other's throats. 
No one except the blacks themselves needed any argument to show that black unity meant black power, and black power meant an end to white domination, eastern and western. Mutota and the new leaders saw and understood this very well. They knew where almost all the gold, copper, iron, and tin had been going from over 4,000 mines. They knew how all the stratagems used by the blacks to bar the Arabs from the interior had failed, and would continue to fail as long as the Arabs controlled all overseas trade by controlling the entire seaboard, and having done so unchallenged for so long, that they now claimed sovereignty over the whole coastal area. Therefore, Mutota in 1440 began the campaign to carry out his own quote-unquote grand design, a great plan that aimed at nothing less than uniting blacks in a vast empire that cut across South Africa below the Limpopo River, covered Rhodesia, with an indefinite boundary beyond the Zambezi River in Zambia and over Mozambique to the Indian Ocean, sweeping southward again to repossess the entire coastline fronting the new empire. Now is all of this the same version as given by Abraham and other Western historians? Would an Arab historian, no matter what the facts might be, present it this way? Of course not. The Western historians employing their usual club to crush rebellion from the master's viewpoints would proclaim sheer romanticism. For see, here now, listen. Does not Professor Abraham make it quite clear at the very outset that no black man, king or commoner, could have conceived of such a vast undertaking? What black man, unaided by whites, could have Mutoda's great and awe-inspiring vision? Abraham and his school might well thank their God that there were many white Arabs around to whom such credit could be given. After a review of so many centuries of the ideological stance of writers where blacks are concerned, anger and outrage should be replaced with amusement. For it has become amusing, to this writer at any rate, to witness the sweating dilemma of these investigators when confronted with any kind of all-black achievements, even in relatively unimportant and routine matters which any human beings any people of any race anywhere would be thought capable of achieving. But where blacks are involved in anything considered outstanding, the whites somehow feel threatened. What is threatened, of course, is the deeply rooted presupposition of the innate inferiority of the blacks. If somewhere in their long history a single record of outstanding achievement by blacks was found by whites and declared at once to be such rather than quote unquote evidently non-negroid if this was ever done the black world has been unable to discover it and if there is an error here or a misconception a correction is welcome but returning to the traditional white line in this case of the Vakaranga king, Abraham and others say that the Arabs persuaded him to unify and expand the country north and south and to the Indian Ocean. The Arabs, who had nothing to gain from a strong and unified black empire and might lose what they had. Professor Abraham says that the Arabs quote-unquote, conceived and implanted in the mind of the Rasfi king a desire for empire. Footnote D.P. Abraham Maramuka 
an exercise in the combined use of Portuguese records and oral tradition. Journal of African History, Volume 2, Number 2, 1961. End of footnote. The empire was to serve as an effective umbrella protecting their operations in the country from the Portuguese. Scholarly reasoning? Logical? Of course, except that there were no Portuguese or Portuguese threat in the area in 1440. They did not arrive until 65 years later. Meanwhile, Mutota moved forward. His first move was to recruit and build up strong, well-trained armies, each under an able general. He displayed the mark of a great executive by his keen insight in the evaluation and selection of men for posts of high responsibility and, in so doing, securing the active support of the great council of the realm. It is significant, too, that his leadership strategy included recruiting soldiers from the surrounding states which were not yet a part of the projected empire. Another important move was to secure unity through the voluntary association of as many states as possible before any conquest by force was attempted. The usual African pattern of empire building was followed. All states joining the imperial union were not only assured of autonomy but special rights also, such as membership in the great council of the empire, a privilege denied territories that had to be conquered. With these policies reaffirmed and settled, Mutota's formidable armies began their sweep in the different planned directions and fields of operation. The main drive was northward under the command of the king himself. Within ten years, all territory between the Limpopo in South Africa to the Zambezi had been brought under imperial rule. The great undertaking was far from completion when Mutota died in 1450. The objectives had been worked out in detailed specifications of a blueprint for expansion, unification, and development of a great empire composed of great states. Unlike most of the societies we have been studying, the Vakaranga clans had become patrilineal. Therefore, Mutota's son, rather than his nephew, was the successor to the throne. This was a happy circumstance since the son, Matope, turned out to be as great a statesman king and general as his late father. He had the greater task because some of the most powerful states in the blueprint had yet to be won, and breaking Arab control over the sea coast, the greatest undertaking had not yet been achieved. Matope assumed the leadership aggressively, having the good fortune of securing the same loyalty the ablest generals had given to his father, supported by fanatically devoted soldiers. This was no accident, for Matope himself had been a popular young commander during his father's reign. Above all, Changa and Tagwa, two of Matope's greatest generals, were his friends. The armies were reorganized, strengthened by relentless training, and expanded. This display of both strength and unity among the blacks puzzled the Arabs. This was something new, amazing. They had a long history of dealing with blacks, and nothing was better known than the disunity, mutual suspicions, and the hostility of one group toward another. So how to explain this spectacle of over 30 different tribal groups forming solid flanks of unity under black leaders? 
Moreover, the Arabs, who had always maintained their own black troops under Arab officers, were barred from joining the imperial forces by both Mutota and Matope. All this was seen as a very real threat to the powerful commercial position the Arabs had in all the hitherto independent states, as well as the equally powerful political influence they enjoyed at the capitals of these states, not to mention their independent status on the coast. Matope's campaigns for the unification of many states into one empire was not easy. For although the Arabs pledged and proclaimed their undying loyalty to the new emperor as this mission of empire building advanced, some of the key states that formed the empire were Ambire, Guniswa in the southern region, Chidema, Utanga, Barwe, Manyika, Madanda, Shiringoma, from the eastern and southeastern region. It took 30 years of unremitting efforts to complete the empire of Mano Motapa with this long eastern border bathed at last by the Indian Ocean. Every detail of his father's specifications having been carried out in full, a weary emperor worn out by the task retired for the final sleep. The year was 1480. What would happen now? The great imperial system had been completed. Black unity had been achieved among numerous language groups on one of the widest scales in history. From Zambia down into South Africa cities of stone dotted the land. The Zimbabwe cities north and south were the deathless symbols of a people's greatness. The long wars of expansion seemed to have stimulated economic development rather than hinder it. The government had gained a more direct control over the mines and mining industries and this meant more control over the Arabs in the interior and on the coast, especially at Sofala, Kilimoni, Senya, and Tete on the Zambezi. The agricultural system was actively promoted by the central government and indeed just as the vast building operations that produced the amazingly beautiful temples and huge structures such as the great Zimbabwe were all government sponsored. So were all the other craft industries. Active government sponsorship, promotion or encouragement in all these fields did not necessarily mean government ownership or direct control. The Emperor Matope also left the country with a great organized religion with a powerful and formally organized priesthood, something unusual in Africa outside of ancient Egypt and Ethiopia. The traditional African religion is essentially the same everywhere on the continent but it is generally unorganized and therefore has seldom had an organized priesthood with a single recognized creed or body of prescribed beliefs. Yet. Just about every African society known believed in one almighty God, no matter by what name he was called or how many lesser gods there might be. In Mano Motapa, he was called Mawari, the Vakaranga version and contribution toward national unity. But would there be unity now? that the last of the two great personalities around whom unity revolved had silently stolen away in the shadows of the great Zimbabwe and was gone forever. The question arises whenever a great leader passes. Political psychology and mass psychology are crucially combined. 
whether a great state survives after the death of the leader who made it great and held its disparate parts together by his charisma alone would depend upon the good fortune of having a successor of equal greatness or the miracle of having developed a strong spirit of national community of oneness of a loyalty and a sense of belonging to the nation that transcends this tribe. There were unifying factors which Matope left behind in his great empire. One was that same organized religion led by highly advanced and literate priesthood. Religious temples at the great Zimbabwe were certainly the national center of religion. The other important factor that should have made unity imperative was the greater prosperity that would flow from economic interdependence and close commercial relations between the constituent states and provinces. The great system of roads and highways, instead of being recaptured by the bush and forest after serving their initial military purpose, could have been converted into permanent national highways crisscrossing the empire and thus serving as the indispensable communication links for administration, trade, travels by the people, and in short, unification. Other factors that should have been a solid foundation for black unity were the similarity of their social institutions and the absolute sameness of their constitutional system. Yet, with Matope's death, the empire began to break up. Why? Notwithstanding all the forces mentioned above that should have made for unity and stability, the actual fact is that the traditional African political system was fundamentally and structurally anti-empire. The very circumstance of the endless process of segmentation, of forever splintering off to form little independent mini-states, developed a built-in disunity, reinforced by the attending growth of different languages. But self-government in each little state and in every village of the smallest state or chiefdom was a way of life, not a theory chiefs and elders as we have seen were leaders advisors and representatives of the people and not their rulers the same operating principle prevailed when a group of states united to form a kingdom and kingdoms united to form an empire but with a disturbing difference centralization tended to erode local autonomy tended to transfer chiefs from the control of their people to the control of the central government. In the case of conquered territories, this change was abrupt and painful, and it was one of the principal reasons for later rebellions and the breakup of kingdoms and empires. Therefore, to say that Arabs and Europeans, let us say it again, were solely or even mainly responsible for the destruction of all great African states would be glossing over or attempting to ignore the principal internal factor, disunity. What the whites did, Asians and Europeans, was to appraise this continent-wide disunity and quote-unquote cash in on it to the fullest extent possible. They did not have to divide and conquer even for the blacks were already divided just as though they were waiting for the foreign conquerors to come the foreigners role was to intensify the disunity to promote the suspicions and hatred that developed from it and to check any tendency or movement toward unity among the blacks footnote this strategy of the whites is as clear and unmistakable today as it was centuries ago. It is an aspect of what I have referred to as the quote-unquote Grand Caucasian Consensus. Yet blacks appear to be heedless of it. 
and the footnote all the Arabs had to do in Mano Motapa was to move swiftly during the period of mourning confusion and uncertainty following Matope's death advisors would surely be needed at the various provincial capitals more than ever surely from these key bases they actively furthered the destruction of an empire the very existence of which was a threat to their own power position within it it was more than a threat for had not Matope sweep to the Indian Ocean reduced their control there leaving them with only three trading stations the Africans already having the every province for itself psychology were simply urged to do more speedily what they were doing more slowly in their own way of Changa and Tagua it must be said to their honor that both remained loyal to Motota and Matope throughout their lifetime devoted servants able generals and finally governors of two of the most important provinces a period of devoted service extending over 40 years now however there appeared to be no reason or even a possibility for transferring the same loyalty and love to Nyahuma weak son and successor to the great king the Arabs hastened to exploit this in Guniusua where Changa was king with aspirations to become emperor Tagua, king of Mbire, supported his longtime friend and colleague in the imperial venture. Both occupied the most favorable position for rallying support, for they held the southern region, which was the first center of Karanga power, the center from which the expansion spread, and the location of the first Zimbabwe capital. The Arab strategy must not be overlooked. Beyond the consideration of greater concessions from the winning side, they did not care which side won. They worked for and supported all sides, each against the other. None wanted a strong empire, but they wanted Changa to launch a war against the existing empire under the pretext of building a greater one than what was possible under the new emperor Nyahuma. The Arabs in the north of course would urge Nyahuma to crush the pretensions of the upstart Changa in the south. Arabs in both regions did more than just advise. They backed their respective rulers with money and materials and men. Black men that is. The Arabs owned private armies of black troops. Thus, the Arabs and later the Europeans were always able to send into battle still more blacks against blacks. So now Chenga, grown old and uncertain, was given an entirely new vision of greatness. He could not only capture the empire and become as great an emperor as he was a general, but in doing so he could create a great brotherhood of Arabs and Africans a brotherhood in which Arabs would be his faithful servants as citizens. To crown it all, and in testimony thereof, he was given the unprecedented honor of the Arab title of Amir, so that, as in the case of the immortal Caesar, his very name, Changa Amir, would mean emperor forever. This flattery was too much for the old man to withstand. The new Changa Amir concluded his war against the central government with victory and the death of Nyahuma in battle in 1490. It was again the same old story of the wars that followed, the internal chaos during the rise and fall of one section of the empire after another. The murder of Changa Amir, or in short, the fragmentation of the empire until what remained was the much reduced northern region and about 600 miles along the Indian Ocean to an inland depth of between two 
and 300 miles. In this much reduced and weakened state, Mano Matapa had to meet a still more ruthless enemy when the Portuguese arrived in 1505. They were aggressive. Their original aim to replace the Arabs first to break and take over their commercial and political power in all of the now disunited kingdoms was ruthlessly pursued. This, it will be recalled, was implementing the original grand design that began in Congo and Angola. Within 50 years, they had penetrated all of these kingdoms, securing concessions of land, establishing trading posts, and missions throughout the interior as well as along the Zambezi and the Indian Ocean coast and islands. The Arabs did not take all this without a fierce struggle, largely centered around attempting to incite the blacks against the Portuguese and thus creating further chaotic situations out of which they hoped somehow to emerge on top. The murder of a Portuguese priest at the court of the Mano Motapan Emperor in 1561 was just what the Portuguese needed as a reason for open intervention with eventual Portuguese sovereignty over the entire region. It was an old trick, well known and practiced by the secret agents of great powers, to sacrifice one's own fellow citizens in a foreign land, if by so doing the larger ends of the state might be served. The Portuguese version that the priest's death was quote unquote engineered by Mohammedans of Mozambique may have or may not have been true. The Portuguese themselves may have done it. This death then meant that the honor of Portugal had been challenged. Instead of attacking the Arabs charged with the crime, however, they directed their pretended outrage at the tottering black empire with military intervention. In 1575, an ultimatum disguised as a treaty required the emperor to expel all Arabs from the country, grant more land concessions for Portuguese gold mining operations, more trading posts and missions, and finally in 1629, the great objective was reached when the emperor Mua Ora acknowledged the king of Portugal as his overlord and became his vassal. Portuguese Caucasianization of the blacks had begun early by having all chiefs, kings, and emperors replace their African names with Portuguese names. There was therefore a long line of emperors Sebastianos, Felipes, Domingos, and Afonsos, here as in Congo and Angola. Footnote I have been referring to name changing throughout the book, yet I doubt whether blacks in general fully realize the role this played in loss of the sense of self worth. End of footnote. The Portuguese land grabs all over the region meant that they were not content with political overlordship and commercial supremacy, but were physically taking over the absolute ownership of the lands of the people in all areas. When the Emperor Domingos summoned up enough courage to resist the onslaught in 1663, he was murdered. This was the year Queen Nzinga died and Portugal now felt unchallenged. Meanwhile, the Portuguese were riding so high and mighty that they had set up their own capitals in the interior at Masapa and in Manyinka centers of general administration and commerce. 
the great Zimbabwe capital city of the empire became a mere shadow of Portuguese power, useful only in carrying out their orders, and, as was the case with the other towns and cities, began to disintegrate toward a state of ruins as the gold wealth of the nation was taken over and depopulization of the country by the slave trade spread. The highly organized African religion under a priesthood that had been so powerful that it had blocked the spread of Islam for over 200 years was now swept aside by the aggressively pushed Christian missions in almost every village. In 1693 the seemingly all-powerful Portuguese were amazed by the rapid development of an unexpected phenomenon the revival of black unity in the southern provinces which were the original center of the empire now still under the leadership of a continuing line of Changamirs. Other formerly separatist kingdoms united under the Changamirs leadership and opened a full-scale war against the Portuguese aiming at driving them out of the land the successful military tactics of Matope and his generals were remembered and followed. Careful, unrushed training and organization, the secret movement of troops in small groups in different directions, all assembling en masse at a stated time and place near the enemy strongholds, then the swift moving and generally surprise attacks by different armies on different Portuguese centers at the same time. These operations took two years of desperate fighting because, of course, the Portuguese forces were better armed. According to the oral records of the blacks, the real reason for the series of victories over the Portuguese was that their black troops only put up token resistance, often not even that whole companies deserting to join their black brothers. With their black shield thus removed, the Portuguese themselves were now exposed to danger. Their number killed was frightening. They fled from the country to zones of comparative safety. The Shangamir armies reconquered most of Mano Motapa and a vigorous anti-Portuguese policy was adopted. This not only aimed at their total exclusion from the interior, but also at ending their influence in what remained of the old empire, which did not come directly under the Shangamir rule. Even trade relations with the whites and other contacts had to be carried on through blacks and mulattoes. The greatly reduced Mano Motapa continued to be further destroyed by the endless internal strife among the blacks, frustrated by the state of decline and helplessness, yet unwilling to join forces with the stronger southern kingdoms which were united under the Shangamirs. Decade after decade, the same story of chaos, social disorganization, and decline repeated itself. This time, however, neither Portuguese nor Arabs were able to re-establish their former power position throughout the region. For a while, all this was going on during 17th, 18th, and into the 19th centuries, three other threatening storm centers had been rising in South Africa. Two of these, the British and the Dutch, had moved inland from the Cape, establishing quote-unquote republics, and thereby completing the encirclement of the blacks of Africa, a most significant development to which I have referred several times. The third threat, insofar as Mano Motapa was concerned, was the rapid rise and expansion of the Zulu Empire under Shaka, an empire which developed from a small village state. 
We have seen that the great migrations over the continent developed from many different causes, too many different forms, and went in all different directions. And we have seen that whole black communities fled before incoming black conquerors, just as they did when whites invaded their land. The great Zulu emperor king became more ruthless in his onslaughts to unify the blacks in an empire that would be greater and stronger than the undisciplined and therefore falling Monomatapa, an empire unlike Monomatapa that would not only serve as one vast and impregnable fortress against the shrewdly scheming whites swarming up from the Cape, but a fortress from which they could be attacked and destroyed. Shaka and his people, like the other countries we have studied, had never seen a white face before the invasions, but he had learned about them more and more as they approached the borders of his country. To resist, he had to unify the blacks first. Kings and chiefs, who could not see the danger in so many little independent states, had better prepare to submit to the imperial rule of the Zulu, flee or prepare to meet their maker. Countless thousands fled en masse before Shaka's mighty armies. Many tribal states moved as a swelling tide under powerful kings and chiefs, spreading death and destruction over the lands through which they marched, a wild and merciless rampage that expressed their anger over Shaka on all the people in their path. The leading groups that struck the Shangamir kingdoms first were the Ndebele, Swazi, and the Shangana. They crossed the Limpopo in 1830 and swept on to the Zambezi, spreading terror as they moved northward. This left the few Portuguese centers that remained in the unconquered territory exposed to the new danger. That strip of territory was once again all that was left of the former empire of Mano Mutapa. The overall scene was one of British-Dutch pressures on the black empire in South Africa. The pressure of the migrating blacks from that empire on other blacks and their destruction of what remained of still another black empire, while the British and the Dutch in fierce competition with each other, moved steadily forward to take over the whole southern region. The Portuguese still held on to their strongly fortified post, especially along the Zambezi, and were able to reach a partition agreement with the British in 1890. Thus, the Portuguese, in gaining Mozambique, still held a vast black empire. The blacks, who had fled from Shaka's armies and had entered the land before the British, opened war against the whites in 1895. The rebellion was under the general leadership of the Matabele invaders, who therefore could expect no support from the general population. They were defeated by the British. In 1902, the blacks of another important kingdom in the old empire, Barway, rose in rebellion. By then, British power was so firmly established that the outcome was predictable. The last black empire had become white-ruled Rhodesia, and its southernmost territory was now under the iron rule of the Dutch invaders of South Africa. This marked the close of still another tragic era. The last emperor of the last black-ruled empire on the African continent, Chioko 
Dan bam un pute. Knew no more how to deal with the engulfing tides of conquest than most of the black leaders who preceded him. Like Katape, the Bakuba king, when the Belgians took over the Congo, none seemed to have had sufficient insights for the white situation. To have just enough sense of race to enable them to realize that the destiny of a whole people was at stake and not just their personal well-being or even the fortunes of a single state. The black queen of Angola remains the outstanding leader who read the white man straight from A to Z and mapped strategies for the confrontations. When she died, she was still queen of the blacks, and her people were still free. <laughs>